Amen. All right. Uh, good effort reading that passage, brother. Caleb, it's a tough one with all those names. See, the secret is, when there's all those names, that's where you get brother Matt or you get brother Jason to come for the reading. You've learned your lesson. You can't do all the Bible reading all the time. It gets challenging. Get those guys to do it. All right, Nehemiah chapter 8. Hope you've got your Bible still open there. Nehemiah chapter 8. And uh, today's the, the 5th, isn't it? The 5th of August. And um, amen. <laughs> it's excited. I mean, I don't know. Man. Is this a Pentecostal church or is this a Baptist church? No, it's all good. Excited for church. I like it. But obviously, uh, it's the 5th of August. Uh, what does that tell you? That tells us, well, my, my goal, Lord willing, is on the 5th of October that the Sepulveders will head down to Sydney so when you think about that, we've got basically two months, two months before we, we go down there. And with the current climate, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, let's just step out in faith, see what the Lord wants. And uh, so in light of it uh, being two months before we head out there, I really want to uh, keep the Wednesday services, Wednesday sermons uh, on topics or, or yeah, preaching things that will benefit the church, you know, in light of the past of being away for some time, Okay. So this might not be, it's not like I'm not going to preach for a series or anything like that, just topics, things that come into my mind, how we as a church can work together because the church is, a, is the body of Christ. Hey, you know, some of you guys are the feet, some are, are the knees, some of you are the, are the hips, some of you guys are the arms, the fingers, the eyes, the mouth. You know, we're all part of this one body. And brethren, you know, as I'm away for those 12 months with the family, and like I said, my desire is to get up here weekly if I can, but I don't know with the coronavirus, I don't know what's going to go ha happen, but anyway... Um, you know, we need the whole body working together. Right. We need the whole body thinking about each other and supporting one another, remembering that when you serve one another, you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my goal over the Wednesdays is just to give you stuff that I probably wouldn't have preached otherwise, just in light of me being away. And so look at Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 8. It says, So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. The title for the sermon tonight is Sermon Preparation. Sermon Preparation. What I want to cover today, especially for those men that are going to be up here preaching more regularly, I, I want to cover what you need to be thinking about when you're putting together a sermon. Now, some of these things I've covered during the men's leadership class, I understand. I haven't just copied and pasted the same information. I've tried to dig in a little deep. I tried to give you more things for you to think about. And right now you might be saying, well, you know, does this, is this really a sermon for me? I'm a child, I'm a woman, I'm not going to get up to preach behind the pulpit. Yeah, that might be true, but remember we're one body, okay? And when somebody comes to get behind the pulpit to open the Word of God, they're doing it because they love you. They're doing it because they want to feed you the Word of God. They're doing it because they want you to grow to be more like Jesus Christ. And so if you understand what, what a preacher does in order to get prepared for a sermon, the work he does, the study, the closeness to God that he needs to be, you're going to appreciate the sermons, okay? And I know when, when you go to church every week, three times a week, you know, it can become a mundane task. Oh, there's Pastor Kevin again preaching. I don't know what he's saying. Now, that's a bad place to be. Understand that the preachers put a lot of work. You know, he spent time with God. The Holy Spirit has been working through that man to prepare something for you to learn. Okay? And so, let's pick it up here in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 1. I really want you, you know, if you're not a preacher, just to appreciate preaching. Appreciate the work that goes behind the scenes. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 1 says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man, hey, we're one body, all right, into the street that was before the water gates, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice here in, in chapter 1, now I know this is not about the local church, but this is about the new uh, temple that's been rebuilt, which was the house of God in the Old Testament. So we can take the principles here, we can learn and apply it to the house of God in the New Testament. But what you notice is what they brought to be preached was the book of the law of Moses. Why do you come to church? Why do you listen to a preacher? Because they're going to come and bring you the book of the law of Moses, the writing of the prophets, you know, the sayings of Jesus, the writings of the apostles. That's what church ought to be about. That's what preaching ought to be about. And when you're preparing a sermon, you've got to start with the Word of God, you know. I'm personally not interested in some preaching where some guy gets behind the pulpit and he says, you know, I'm going to amaze you, you know, by my intellectual study, you know, uh, you know, my well thought out logical reasons why Adam and Eve had or didn't have a belly button. 
Okay, that, I'm not interested in that. I, I, I'm not coming to hear the wisdom of man. All right, God doesn't tell us in the Bible whether Adam and Eve had a belly button. It's not important. It's stupid. I don't want to hear that nonsense. We come to church because we come to hear the book of the law of Moses. Okay, the Bible. That's what we come to preach. And so preach is the first thing you need to do and understand, look, we, we, we all have different personalities. You know, we're, we're, you know, not everybody is as charismatic as others. But listen, why people come to New Life Baptist Church, at least to this church, is to hear the Word of God. They're not interested in your fancy stories and your fancy intellect, okay? Because it comes short. You know, it fails in comparison to the wisdom that comes from the Word of God. All right, look at verse number two. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So church, men and women together, listening to God's word, right? We're not like the Muslims, where the men worship over here, and the ladies worship over there. No, men and women coming together, families coming together. We're a family integrated church. We want all family members in church, moms, dads, children, everybody here learning together. Verse number three. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now you thought we were the only church that went back to back with services from the morning 9 a.m. all the way to midday with a second service, right? You thought that was Kevin's idea, Pastor Kevin's idea. No, actually it's coming from the book of Nehemiah. Hey, they're, they're reading from the morning till midday. Okay, now it's not all reading, of course, we'll soon see that it's not just reading the Word of God, but they're preaching the Word of God as well, okay? And so, you know, this is part of the reason, or not, uh, should I say it's the main reason, or it's one reason why we do church the way we do, okay, from morning to midday, all right? And, uh, you know, what I want you to also notice there at the end of verse number three, it says, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And so, brethren, once again, you come to church. It's an effort, you know, straight after work, especially a Wednesday night. Straight after work, you're tired. You've been, especially the men, working all day or whatever. You know, it gets late. You get tired. You start to doze off. You know, sometimes when I bring my little kids, they start to doze off because it becomes a long day for them. But what we see here, we need to be attentive. Pay attention. If you're making the effort to be in church, pay attention. Give focus to the Word of God, okay? That's why you're here. We need to learn from His Word. And then look at verse number four. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. So here we go, you know, the pulpit of wood is biblical. Okay, have you ever wondered why this is here? Yeah, it's here because Nehemiah, right? This is what we learn in the book of Nehemiah here. All right, look at verse number five. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Now look, we have a little step here, okay? I'm not very tall, it makes me feel a little bit taller when I, when I step up here and preach behind the pulpit. Hey, you know what? Having a step, having an elevated position for the preacher, that's biblical as well, okay? He stood there uh, uh, above, the, above the people. And then, uh, verse number six, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So hey, saying Amen to the preaching, Amen, amen, agreeing to what is being heard. That's biblical. <laughs> amen. So, you know, hey, you know, men, if you agree with what's being preached, say amen. Okay, it encourages the preacher to know, hey, you know, I'm not preaching something off the wall. <laughs> you know, what, what is being preached is truth. Okay, amen is, I agree, that is true. Okay, that's what you're saying when you say amen. Now, verse number seven. Also, Jeshua and Baini and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shebathiah, uh, Hodijah, Maiah, Siah, Kelita, Azariah, Jozebad, Hanan, Pelaiah, and the Levites. Now, let's pay attention now. The Levites, so the Levites were also the priests that were teaching, okay? Caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So, preachers, this is your job, okay? This is the sermon is sermon preparation. What you're preparing to do, what your motive is, what you're trying to accomplish is for people to understand the law, to understand the Bible. Once again, it's not about showing off your intellect, not showing off how you're so intelligent you can work out some minor issue that doesn't matter in the Bible, okay? That, that's not what people need to understand. They need to understand the Word of God, okay? 
You know, one of the qualifications of being a pastor, you know, taking on the office of a bishop, is apt to teach. Being able to teach so people can understand and learn. All right, verse number eight. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Hey, there are three things here that you need to pay attention to, preachers, when you get ready to preach. Number one, you need to read in the book of the law of God distinctly. What does distinctly mean? It means clearly. You know, something is distinct. It, it, it's clearly uh, uh, you know, noticeable compared to something else. Okay? It's clear. It's plain. It's without confusion. Okay? So your challenge as a preacher is to take the Word of God, which can be challenging, which, can, you know, for someone that hasn't been saved for very long, maybe a babe in Christ, there are certain passages that they can't fully understand. Your job as a preacher is to break down that passage and teach it distinctly, clearly, so they can understand what is being taught there. Okay? Not just that. Look, it says there, and gave the sense. And gave the sense. That's basically like saying your, your job is to... Uh, is for the preaching to make sense. You know, for the, for the law of God to make sense to the hearer. You gave the sense. You know, the explanation, the preaching makes sense. You don't want to be a preacher that's all over the place. You know, one moment you're saying salvation is by grace through faith alone. The next moment you're saying, well, you've got to repent of your sins as well. Hey, th that's not making sense. That's a conflict. That's confusion. That's not the job of a preacher. The preacher is to be black and white, very clear as to what he believes and what he's teaching. And then finally, and cause them to understand the reading. So once again, your job is so the congregate, uh, the church, the congregation learns. Okay, learns. That's what you're trying to do. Again, it's not about you put on a show. You want the people of God. You ought to love the people of God, the church so much that you want them to understand something. You want them to get something out of the sermon so they can grow thereby. Okay, so they can become a little more like Jesus Christ. So they know there's something in their life that they need to change. And look, yeah, I'm talking to the preachers, right? I'm talking to those men that are going to stand up to preach. But you, the, the congregation, those that are listening, okay, you want to walk away from church service having learned something. You know, something being a little clearer for you. You know, for you to understand something. And there's nothing wrong with you if, if there's something you didn't understand during the service, during the sermon, to go to the preacher and say, look, I, I didn't quite understand what you were saying there. Can you please uh, explain that to me a little further? There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever okay because the goal is for the congregation to understand and so as i said the title for the sermon tonight is sermon preparation and again i'm primarily you know preaching to the preachers but to everybody and so what i first want to cover you're going to you know in some bible college courses there's a there's a uh, course called homiletics and homiletics is how you preach I'm, I'm very happy that I got to, to learn. I got to do a course in homiletics. This was like when I was, how old was I? Probably 23 or something along the lines. And uh, it wasn't in Bible college. It was through my local church. It was with my pastor. And I really appreciate it because the same things that I learned there, I still apply today, okay? But what, you know, when it comes to sermons, there are three types of sermons. There are three types of sermons, okay? And let me just tell you what those three are. Number one, there's topical, a topical sermon. Number two, an expository sermon, Okay, and number three, a textual sermon. Okay, a topical, expository, and textual. All right, so I want you guys to kind of understand what these are. These aren't foreign words. Most preachers know what they're talking about. And, uh, you know, most preaching that you listen to, you're going to be able to basically break it down into one of those three things. So what I get you to do, please turn to Gal Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to look at Galatians 6. And pretend we're going to put together a topical sermon or an expository sermon or a textual sermon just from that passage, okay? So Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, please. Now, let me start with expository sermon, okay? Because these are the sermons that you're most familiar with that I preach. Generally speaking, on Sunday mornings, we're going chapter by chapter through the Bible, aren't we? Okay, right now we're going through 1 Peter, but we've gone through Genesis, we've gone through 1 and 2 Corinthians, we've gone through a few Psalms. And what am I doing during that time? Isn't most of my sermon basically on that chapter? You know, most of my key points are from that chapter. Yes, from time to time we'll be going to other passages, but we're not going to other passages to learn some new truth. We're going to those other passages to just help support what is already in that chapter that we're going through. Hey, that's called an expository sermon. We're taking a huge chunk, a whole chapter, and we're building our points from what is within that chapter, okay? Now, 
So when we turn to Galatians 6, and I'm not going to give an example of this because you see this every Sunday morning, okay? Expository would be me, me taking the entire chapter, Galatians chapter 6, and just preaching verse by verse by verse by verse all the way to the end and trying my best to expound on that so you understand the reading. Now, one of the challenges with an expository sermon is that some of the chapters could have many topics, okay? And so the goal, in order for your sermon to not sound all over the place, is to find some key themes, one theme or two themes, not too many themes, some, just some, one or two major themes. So as you're going through that chapter, you're kind of putting those verses back into the main theme that you see in the sermon. That way, the sermon feels unified. You know, it feels concise. It doesn't feel like you're going every, everywhere, you know. I don't know if you guys have ever heard preaching where it's like, I thought you're going to start on this and, okay, I get it. Then all of a sudden, the pastor ends on a totally separate topic, unrelated. I've been there. It's like, did he switch sermons midway through the preaching? Well, that's the challenge of an expository sermon because, a lot, you know, obviously the whole chapter can have different thoughts and you want to keep that one major theme. But let's look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Let's now take an example of a topical sermon, okay, a topical sermon. Now, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Now, if I wanted to do a topical sermon, what does that mean? Where you take one topic, okay, one topic. You know, the, probably the, the clearest example was on Sunday, Sunday afternoon, I preached on pornography, okay? So I took the topic of pornography, and that was the main topic, and I wasn't really building on any major passage. We were going all over the place, right? We are going all over the Bible, just taking certain truths, you know, of that topic and trying to build a sermon from that. That is called a topical sermon, one major topic. So we, as we look at the, uh, Galatians, uh, Galatians 6 verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. I'll be like, yeah, all right. The topic that I want to preach on is, you know, people that are spiritual. How to be spiritual. Maybe we'll take the sermon title and call it, Ye which are spiritual. And so my topic is, I want everybody to know what it means to be spiritual, how you can be spiritual, or if you're carnal, or if you're in the flesh, right? And that's my main topic. And so I'm not really building from that verse necessarily. I might take some, some thoughts there. I'm not necessarily taking, you know, the whole thought of the chapter there, but it's spiritual. That's what we're doing, right? The spiritual man. And so the points that I build on that sermon will come from other places, other places throughout the Bible. Let me give you some examples. Point number one might be, you don't need to turn there, I'll just I'll give you some examples. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, which says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So point number one of my topical sermon will be, hey, you know, God's making us a spiritual house. We're to, we're to offer spiritual sacrifice. That's what it means to be spiritual. And then I'll be like, point number two, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So be point number two, you know, to be a spiritual person, you've got to sing the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs. That's what makes you a spiritual person, right? And so you can see I'm just going all over the place, taking different thoughts of the Bible. It's all good, nothing wrong with that style of preaching. It's good, you know, learning about a topic. And then I'll be like, point number three is coming from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, which says, If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And so the spiritual man will say, hey, the Bible is the commandments of God. It's written by God. You know, that's point number three. And so we need to, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to learn and study the Word of God. That's going to help you be a spiritual man. Okay? So you can see, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying to preach a sermon there, but, you know, <laughs> Um, that's just an example of a topical sermon. We've taken what it means to be spiritual. We've gone to different places and we've built that sermon. You know, there was three main points there and that would be a topical sermon, right? All right. What is a textual sermon? Textual sermon. What's a textual, you know, or text, right? So that's where the word comes from. But let me give you an idea of verse number one again, Galatians 6 verse one. Look at it again. Now we're going to, I'm going to give an example of a textual sermon from this same verse, okay? So Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, let's read it one more time. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. All right, so 
this would be the title of my sermon, okay? I'd be saying, okay, restoring a brother in a fault, okay? That'll be, the, that'll be the title, how to restore a brother when he's in fault, okay? Now, the textual sermon is you looking at, um, you know, a few verses, maybe one verse, maybe two, three, just, just a, a sample number of verses, and your main points don't come from other passages, but your main points come from that text in of itself, okay? And you still will go to other passages, but again, they're kind of like sub-points to the main point that you're doing. Again, supportive verses of that text. And so we'll start, okay, uh, restoring your brother in a fault. Let's keep going there. It says, ye which are spiritual, okay? So point number one will be, hey, the one that restores a brother in a fault, you have to be spiritual. You have to be mature. You can't be this carnal, worldly Christian and think you got your, your job is to restore someone in a fault, okay? That'll be point number one. And let's keep going. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Point number two, in order for you to restore a fallen brother is you've got to have the spirit of meekness. You need to approach him meek with meek, meekness, right? You can't just beat him down, beat him up while he's down. Hey, you've got to have that meekness about you. And then what else do we see there? In verse number uh, one, it says, considering thyself. So point number three, well, okay, consider yourself. Hey, because you can fall. You can sin. You can get into some bad places. So, you know, you've got to be careful when you're restoring somebody that you're careful not to fall yourself, right? And then it says, lest thou also be tender. So there's my three points, right? Uh, you which are spiritual, it's got to be a spiritual man that restores a brother in fault. You've got to have meekness and you've got to consider yourself. Be careful about, you know, how, how your walk with the Lord is. And so that would be a textual sermon. Hope that makes sense. Okay, the points are coming from the text, okay? Then... We might also have, and by the way, textual sermon, if, if just to give an example of a sermon that I've preached, remember I did a series on the seven churches of Revelation. Okay, so we're looking at Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3. I wasn't doing a whole chapter. We were just taking verses about specific churches, okay, maybe two, three, four verses, and I was building my points off what Jesus Christ was saying to those churches. That would be an example of a textual uh, a sermon, okay? And then... Also, so those are the three main ones, topical, expository, textual. I hope that makes sense to you guys. But you can also have hybrids, okay? You, you can have a bit of mix. You, know, you, you don't need to necessarily follow these things. But it is important when you get up to put a sermon together that you decide what kind of sermon am I going to preach. When you understand this will be topical, this will be expository, or it will be textual, it will help you uh, put that sermon together, okay? So it feels a little more concise. Now, there is a hybrid version. And for example, a hybrid would be when I just did the series on the armor of God. Okay, did the armor of God. So it's a bit of, it, it was a bit of both. It was only a handful of verses that talk about putting on the whole armor of God. And those verses talk about putting on the helmet of salvation, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, etc. And so it's only a handful of verses. Okay. And so, you know, it, it's kind of textual. But then because I did a whole series, okay, and I did, you know, one sermon on righteousness, one sermon on, you know, the sword of the spirit, one sermon on pre the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so those sermons became topical sermons, right? Even though it's one of, uh, part of one series and it's, it's textually in spirit, but the practical way of it being taught was topical because we're hitting each one with each uh, topic within that armor of God, okay? So that's an example of a hybrid version, okay? And so those are the three types of sermons. Now, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. We've looked at types of sermons, okay? I don't know if that was interesting for you guys, but it, it is helpful. It is helpful when you can identify what kind of sermon am I going to preach, okay? The next thing I've got here is the purpose of the sermon, okay? What is the purpose of the sermon? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 reads, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, Timothy was a pastor. Paul is writing to Timothy as a pastor and he says, look, when you're teaching the scriptures, this is what you want to get out of it. This is the profit that you want to get. You know, when you're preaching God's word, prophet's doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. And so what's important as a preacher, as you're putting your sermon together, you want to make sure that your sermon meets one of these criteria, one or more, okay? It can be one or more, okay? So let me just give you some ideas of what they are. Let's start with the first one, and it's profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is to teach, 
Okay, that's all it means. You know, teaching or to teach. And so if I'm teaching you doctrine, let's say I want to teach you guys on the second coming of Christ. Okay, I want to teach you what the Bible says about these things. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to give you more knowledge. My goal or my purpose of the sermon is for you to attain more knowledge, right? To understand, to, to learn more about the Bible. In Isaiah 28 verse 9, it reads, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So we're going to start with the milk of the word of God. And then it says this, For precepts must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, Okay, and so what we see there, you know, God will use stammering lips. God will use you in your weaknesses to be able to teach people the Word of God, to teach people doctrine, okay? And it's important that you learn something. It's important that you say, hey, I want to take something from the Bible here. So next time they read that chapter, they read that book, they have a better understanding of what is being taught through that book, okay? They have a better understanding on this doctrine. They have a better understanding on the Trinity. They have a better understand what whatever doctrine it is. Find a topic, right? A doctrine you want to make sure people grow and learn and understand because they're going to your, the congregation. Will hear false teachings from somewhere. You know that there'll be false prophets out there, false preachers out there, and if they haven't gained the understanding on certain doctrines, they're easily going to be swayed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That's not what we want for the church, okay? And so it's important that we learn. My biggest frustration was going to church, you know, and just hearing watered down preaching. And I'm like, am I, I'm not learning anything. Can you tell me a little bit about the Bible? Can you tell me something? I, I, I want to know more. I want to, I want to know the deeper things in the Word of God. I want to gain understanding. Next time I read my Bible, I want to know what that's about, okay? Who was this man? Who was this prophet? What's going on here? I don't fully understand. The preachers failed me, okay, in church. And so my goal, you know, I spend a lot of hours putting sermons together because my goal is that you would walk away with some further understanding. So you gain some knowledge. I want you to be fed with the Word of God, all right? And so, you know, uh, something else that might fall under this category is uh, biographical uh, preaching, bi teaching, biographical teaching. So where you might take one character in the Bible, you know, you might take Moses, or you might take Joseph, or you might take, you know, King David, and basically teach a whole sermon about that one person, okay? That would be an example of doctrine as well. You're teaching about individual people in the Word of God, okay? So doctrine to teach. We want to equip ourselves with knowledge, all right? That's one purpose for preaching a sermon. The second purpose that was mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, profitable for reproof. Say, so what is reproof? Well, reproof is the act of reproving. Say, so what's that? Rebuking. Okay, rebuking. All right. So one, you know, another purpose for your preaching is to rebuke sin. Okay, rebuke sin. Rebuke false doctrine or rebuke false prophets. There's a time for that as well. Okay. And I guess the clearest example again on Sunday, preaching about pornography. Right? I, was, I was rebuking that sin. Okay, and we need to hear that kind of preaching from time to time as well. All right, and so these things are important. Okay, but you, as a preacher, you want to make sure that you have your, your sermons are all different. Sometimes you're just preaching on doctrine. All right, sometimes you're rebuking. That's important. And you know, there was, there was this uh, time where I, was, I won't name the church right now, but there was a, there was a church I was going to, and there was like an assistant. Oh man, I won't say that now. Ah, oh, too late. There was an assistant pastor. Okay. And he wouldn't preach too often. He maybe would preach like once a month, all right? And I remember the first time I heard him preach, he got up to preach, and he like ripped face. I mean, he was like having a go at all the church, you know, how we weren't friendly. We weren't, you know, greeting visitors. I mean, he was just tearing up the church. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> it's like, man, yeah, just, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it feels good sometimes to hear, you know, the, the, the face ripping sermon, all right? And then... I was like, man, that was a great, he's a great preacher. I hope I can hear him more often, right? And then next month, he got up to preach again. And he's ripping, I don't know what he's ripping on this time. He's, he's criticizing, he's ripping on the church. He's I'm like, man, yeah, you know, you, know, you know, don't stop, brother. You know, just keep going, right? Amen, I'm hearing, all right? I was like, wow, this guy's awesome. 
And then the next month he got up again. He's criticizing the church and he's ripping face and he's like, oh, you're failures. And you're, at that point, I'm like, is he going to preach anything else? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and then like your fourth month and the fifth, and it's like, oh, every time you get up to preach, I know we're in trouble. Every time he got up to preach, I'm like, man, I guess God hates us now because we're such a bad church. You know, we've really let him down, right? And listen, I mean, there's a time for that and it's exciting at the beginning, but if that's what you're doing, like, oh, just nonstop, telling everybody how you're a sinner, you've let, you know, you can't, you're just not faithful to God, how you actually give it to church, you're letting us down, hey, there are visit. why haven't you greeted the visit? what's wrong with you people? Man, are you coming every single week here and preaching like that? You're just going to be like, why am I in church? God seems to hate us. I think I was better off before I came to church. All right? Or if you're just constantly rebuking false prophets. Now, there's a time for that. There's a place for that. But again, you know, you come to church this Wednesday. I'm preaching against, I don't know, the Catholics. Like, amen. All right, next Wednesday. All right, I'm going to be preaching against the Mormons. Amen. So who are you preaching against? I'm going to preach against the, the Pentecostals this time. Every, every Wednesday. So like, wait, he's always going to preach against somebody. I mean, you're not going to, listen, it's, preaching is for you. It's for you to grow, right? If I'm just preaching about other people constantly, what are you going to get? I mean, every, listen, every sermon against false prophets or against false religion is basically the same. They've got the gospel wrong, <laughs> right? They, they preach some false gospel, and because they're not saved, they're mixed up with all other doctrines. That's basically, that's basically you know, every sermon about some false prophet. It's the same sermon. And just, just, just replace the name, I guess, you know? That's all it is. And so, you know, there's a time, for, again, there's a time for that. I'm not saying there's, there's, that's wrong, but you don't want that to be all you do all the time, okay? You need to mix it up with all these things, all right? The next one that's on that list was profitable for correction, correction, okay? Now, this sounds like rebuke, but it's not really. Rebuke is just saying, hey, this is wrong. Correction is continuous improvement, okay? Continuous improvement, okay? So, you know, we're not perfect. We, we, we still fail, you know, we, you know, we're still not where I personally want to be as a church. And look, I think we can still grow, we can still do better, we can still do more. And so, you know, correcting something that might be failing is important. We need to be able to preach about that. You know, in Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul kept trying to improve. Paul kept trying to correct the things that he has in his life. And so we need a, a time for that as well, right? Hey, we're failing in this. We need to improve in this area. We need to do that. Hey, just your personal sanctif sanctification, your personal growth, right? Your personal overcoming of sins and, and having uh, how, do, how do I change that, you know? Hey, you know, replace, you know, the worldly rock and roll music, which, which disgraces the name of Christ with some biblical hymns, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That would be a correction, right? We, we need to uh, have that kind of preaching. And also, just the failings at church. You know, maybe there are failings at church, and uh, no church is perfect. You know, I love this church. I think we're doing great, you know, coming into three years. I think we're doing really well, but, you know, are we perfect? Have, have we reached the goal? Are, are we where we need to be? No, we, we need to keep growing. And so, if you can, uh, uh, no, no, you say where you are. Uh, I'll just read to you Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And uh, this is the church of Ephesus. And so the church of Ephesus was doing some great works for God. They were accomplishing a lot. But then Jesus says to them, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, okay, so they, there, was, there was a failing. There was an issue in the church that they weren't able to do. And then in verse number five, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will, re and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And so this is correction, right? That the preacher needs to get behind the pulpit and say, hey, we've left the first love. We're not doing the first works that God has asked us to do. Let's repent. Let's get back on track. Let's go back to the things that God wants us to do. Hey, that would be a preaching on correction, profitable for correction, okay? And the last thing that was mentioned there, profitable for instruction. Instruction. What is instruction? Instruction is passing orders or direction, you know? And so this is more about Christian living, right? You're, you're trying to give people instruction how to live for the Lord, you know, encouraging them, them to, to do that, you know, encouraging people to attend church, to read their Bibles, to pray, to go soul winning, hey, just to praise God, just to glorify God, you know, give people instruction, hey, lift up your voices and, and love the Lord and, and thank the Lord for everything He has given you. Hey, this would be instruction, just your, your regular Christian living. We need to be reminded of those things again and again and again, all right? So once again, the purpose of preaching that we get there from uh, 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, was it needs to be profitable, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay? So for the preachers, I really want you to think about this, you know? Yeah, you know, it's fine to get a whole bunch of verses together, but think about what, what's my purpose here? What am I trying to accomplish? Is it one of these things? Is it a mixture of those things? And if it's none of those things, you better go back to the you know, drawing board and start all over again. And say, boy, you know, I'm not really profiting in the church. I need to go back and, and have a sermon that's going to meet at least one of these criterias, all right? Now, please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The next thing that I've got here is the goal of preaching. Now, that kind of sounds like purpose. Sometimes purpose and goal can be interchangeable, I guess. But the goal is kind of like the end result, okay? You know, you've got the purpose, I, I want to, you know, uh, you know um, teach doctrine, but you want an end result out of that, okay? What's the end result? Again, it's for the congregation. What is the congregation going to get out of this? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 14. And verse number three, but he that prophesieth, and prophesieth, remember, that's just another way of saying preaching, right? And he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort, okay? So, this is what you want. So, when you finish the sermon, this is what you want the congregation to be left with. Either they've been uh, edified, exhorted, or they've been comforted. That's the goal. Okay, well, again, a mix of these things, okay? And if your sermon's just not doing it, you've you got to go back to the drawing board and get that sermon, you know, fix it, fix it, change the conclusion, make sure that it's something that addresses these issues that we see here in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. And so let's talk about edification first. Edification, okay? What is edification? To edify. What is to edify? Well, in Spanish, the word for building, like a building in Spanish, is edificio which is where edifying comes from, okay? And so a building, so what is edifying? It's to build up, all right? It's to construct, to make something stronger, to build. That's what edification is. You know, our jobs as preachers is to help the church mature and grow, go from the milk of the Word of God and to get onto strong meat, to gain some knowledge, to gain some understanding, right? And, or maybe just, just, uh, just, just uh, to gain strength, sp spiritual strength. You know, uh, gain boldness, uh, gain courage, something that will help them build themselves up to be more like Jesus. You're in 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 12. It says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Amen. Excel! He wants you to do the best, you know, do the best job you can, right, with what God has given you. He wants you to, to uh, you know, be successful in edifying the church, okay? And so that's the goal. You, you can edify with knowledge, yes. You can edify with, with uh, reminding people that the Lord is near and He's your rock and He's your strength and He's your, he's your fortress, you know, in, in times of difficulties. There's that as well. The next one that was mentioned, edification and exhortation. Exhortation. What is exhortation? Well, exhortation is kind of like to encourage or motivate, okay? Encourage or motivate. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, okay? So that's what exhortation is, to encourage, to motivate you to love, hey, to love the Lord God more, hey, to love the brethren more, hey, to love lost souls more, but also that you will do good works, that you would serve the Lord, okay? And so sometimes a preacher might get up and preach on soul winning, okay? Say, why is he preaching on soul winning? To, edu to, to motivate others, you know, to get back out there, maybe dedicate a, a little bit more time in the soul winning, become more consistent. The ones that haven't gone soul winning yet, hey, get out there as a silent partner. It's to motivate that person, all right? And uh, if you guys, can you turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 14? Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Acts chapter 14 and verse number 21. So exhortation is to encourage, to motivate, okay? And I, by the way, I'm going to ask, especially the kids, when I'm finished preaching this sermon, I'm going to, so pay attention kids, you better start paying attention. I'm going to ask you guys a question, and whoever gets it right will get a prize or bring it on Sunday, okay? 
So keep paying attention. Remember, attentive ears, right? Attentive to the preaching of God's word. All right, exhortation. Uh, sorry, Acts 14, verse 21. Let's read this. Acts 14, verse 21. It says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, so by the way, if they're preaching the gospel, are they, getting, are they getting people saved? Yeah, they're getting people saved, okay? And so those saved people are babes in Christ. They don't know much, right? So let's understand who they're preaching to, who these people are. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Now look at this. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Okay, what's exhorting? To motivate them, to encourage them, okay? And so these preachers are getting out there and say, look, continue in the faith. Don't give up. Keep serving the Lord. And then it says here, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And that's when you need to really exhort people, is when people are going through trials and tribulations, when people are going through difficulties. Hey, when people maybe are concerned about COVID-19, what does this mean for life? Hey, people, you know what the people need to hear? Pre, uh, exhortation. They need to be exhorted. They need to be motivated. They need to be encouraged. Hey, just keep serving the Lord. Just, just hold strong to the faith, right? Exhortation. Motivate. Encourage the brethren. And the last one that was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it said, and comfort, and comfort. You know, there's nothing wrong with comforting the brethren. There's nothing wrong with, with you know, understanding that some people go through difficulties. Now, look, generally speaking, I'm, I'm personally a pretty happy guy. Even when I'm going through some difficulties, I can see a positive side of it. But not everyone's the same. All right, some people really dwell on the negative, and you know, that's something they need to change. And, and uh, you know, with the Lord's help, they can, you know, uh, you know, be encouraged. But you need to understand that sometimes, you know, I, I can't, I, I don't assume that all of you are going to react like me, okay? And there are a lot of people that do get discomforted for whatever reason, whatever trials, whatever difficulties they're going through, whatever illnesses they may be going through. And sometimes the people just need comfort they just need to know that the lord loves them the lord is there to help them you know and uh so to comfort is to give relief and comfort okay and as i've been preaching you know just most more recently in the last couple of months because of covid19 right you know m part of my goal is to help you keep your minds on the eternal matters Okay, you know, too many Christians today are just focused on the temporary, focused on the earthly, focused on all the masks, focused on all the vaccination, you know, and they're getting discouraged, they're being discomforted. You know, the greatest comfort you can get is just remember, we're sojourners. You know, this is not our home. Our home is heaven. Let's live for eternity. Let's live for heaven. You know, turn off the TV. Hey, you know why I preach that? Because people need to be comforted. People need to learn what they need to do in order to find comfort in the Lord. And, you know, this world can be very distracting. There's a lot of difficulties in this world. And I'm just going to read another passage to you here in Romans 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4 reads, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Okay? You know what's going to give people comfort? comfort of the scriptures okay don't forget what did we start with the fact that we come and we want to listen to the word of god this is what we come for okay the bible and guess where people are going to find the comfort in the bible guess where people are going to be exalted in the bible guess where people are going to be edified in the bible these are god's words it's a powerful book it's a spiritual book it's a living book and and you know for for the congregation i don't want you to ever think you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to go to church today because Brother Bob is preaching, right? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't really enjoy Brother Bob's, you know, sermons. I'm just going to miss out this week. That, that's wicked, you know, having that attitude. You know, Brother Bob, there's not Brother Bob here, right? But, <laughs> but Brother Bob, I'm telling you, loves you. All right? He's studied the Word of God. He's been putting his sermon together. He's been saying, how can I feed my brother or sister in the Lord? God, help me. Lord, Lord, work with me. He's been spending hours and hours trying to put something together so you can be comforted, so you can be exalted, so you can be edified, and you just have the attitude, oh, Brother Bob's preaching. I won't turn up. Please don't be like that while I'm gone. Don't be like that while I'm I'll be so disappointed, you know, if you guys end up like this. You know, and I don't want the preachers that get behind this pulpit to think I need to be someone else. I want Brother Bob to be Brother Bob, okay? And I want Brother, what's another name that we don't have here? Brother Zach to be Brother Zach. Who else? Are, who are Fred. 
Fred, Brother Fred, to preach like Brother Fred, okay? Because God will use people's personalities, introverted, extroverted, it doesn't matter, okay? There are plenty of people like this in the Bible. There are plenty of stammering lips, okay? Uh, he will, God will use them in a mighty way to preach some great truths. You know, Brother Bob's going to be able to preach some things that I would never have thought about to preach. And, you know, God will use him to touch your hearts and to teach you something new, you know? And so, you know, like I said, this sermon is not just for the preachers, the whole congregation. I want to appreciate the effort that every man does. And why do I encourage men to come up to preach? So they can appreciate it. They, can, they realize, hey, you know what? It's not like Pastor Kevin sitting there for 10 minutes writing out some sermon notes before the service. You know, it takes hours of, of thought. You know, it takes a fear of God, a concern for the brethren in order to prepare a sermon. And so the title for the sermon tonight was Sermon Preparation. Okay, so I'm almost done now. Now here's the question. Did I preach? Any of the kids can answer. You can, boys or girls, doesn't matter. All right. I guess you're considered a kid, Caleb, so you can, you can answer. All right. What type of sermon did I just preach? Was it textual or topical or expository? Yes, Paris? I'll, I'll give you a point for, for, um, for the answer, but it's not the right answer. Yes, Lily, you're next topical what was the topic how to prepare a sermon and i went all over the place i got a verse here i got a verse there i got a verse there right it wasn't based on a, a certain text it was all over the yes lock you want to say something Definitely more than one. well you got to go back and listen to the sermon on youtube <laughs> callum that's his homework for tonight he's got to go back and listen to the whole sermon <laughs> all right <laughs> all right god you should have just said topical all right let's pray Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you.